So up next, we've got Arctic Mine. He's going to be talking about scaling and economic implications of the adaptive block size in Monero. I, I just read that from there, but basically he's going to be talking about Monero's adaptive block size. What does that mean? What does that mean for the economies of scale? All that different type of stuff. He's a smart guy. This is a Monero core team member. You're in the presence of a literal god. So I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so um, let's everyone give a, give a big snap to Arctic Mine. Well, thank you for the excellent introduction. Um, first, a little of my own background. Um, I got involved in Monero in uh, 2014 after being involved with the uh, Bitcoin since 2011. Um, I originally started as an investor and also as a miner when you can mine Bitcoin with GPUs. That was the day. I uh, saw the crash of, just after the crash of, uh, in 2011, where Bitcoin went from $32 to $2. That was the day. Um, I got involved with Bitcoin through 2012 and 2013. And one of the things that I did is I asked, uh, is I asked the question, how can it fail? I asked the question, um, where a particular problem. So I spend a lot of time studying the scaling issue and the block uh, size debate in Bitcoin. It was in this process in early 2014 when I actually came across uh, a post in Bitcoin talk I talked about Monero. Did not mention scaling at all, but it actually got me interested in Monero. And the first thing I did is I spent three weeks analyzing how Monero scales and how is it different from Bitcoin. Um, I started getting more involved and interested in Monero uh, and learning about Monero and in particular spending a lot of time looking at scaling in Monero. Um, in early 2016, I was given the honor of being part of the core team of Monero which I accepted. And what was originally research that I did primarily as due diligence as an investor has become now part of my contribution to, a significant part of my contribution to the Monero project. So what I'm gonna be talking about is scaling. I'm gonna break my talk into two parts, two aspects of scaling. Now, when people talk about scaling in a cryptocurrency, these are totally commonly conflated. So they talk about these two aspects of scaling as one issue. They're fundamentally different. The first part is technological support for scaling. And the question there is, is can the technology actually support scaling today and in the near future? The second question is, how does the social covenant and or business model and or protocol uh, support for long-term scaling. So what is a social covenant, business model, and protocol long-term support for scaling? And that is fundamentally different from the first question, can we transmit the blockchain through the internet, for example, with current technology? So the question is, first question one asks is, is it possible with our current and future technology to provide the necessary computing power, bandwidth, and digital storage needed to support blockchain growth. And we're talking over decades. Um, so the question is, can we really continue to scale and what is gonna happen with technology? This is the technological side of scaling. The second question is, what are the lessons from history that we can learn when it comes to scaling. And I'll present my next slide, and my next slide, I, it's actually quite dramatic. Most people are familiar with scaling from the point of view of, say, a few a decade. Now, I'm talking here going all the way back to the 1850s. This, by the way, is a shot from um, the cost of a million standardized operations per second. So one can think of a standard set of computer operations, and then you price it 
as a function of time. And in particular, one looks at it, this is of course a log scale, one looks at the changes and trends that have occurred in, in basically the last 160 years. And these have profound implications to how we do finance, to how we do banking, to how we keep track of our money, and to a lot of the technologies we use today in, in, in centralized ledgers. And it's quite a significant in very ways. I mean, if you look before about 1940, i.e. during the Second World War, basically it was a flat history. We were talking about the earlier tabulating machines, and they came on in the 1890s by IBM. Uh, some ideas in the United Kingdom, a British Empire at the time, of the um, Babbage engines, various engines that were cr created. This area here is primarily tabulating, tabulating machines that were improved by the Hollerith company, which later became IBM. And going to the 1930s, and again we saw this application of tabulating machines with the Second World War, of course, there was a major demand for computing technology, uh, primarily on the side of the Allies in the sense of how do we crack the German enigma. And this led to a fair amount of research in, in the United Kingdom. They used telephone relays, um, large numbers of telephone relays, and built some of the most primitive computers, the early computers. We then get into things such as vacuum tube computers in this range here, then you move to transistors, and then we start looking at integrated circuits all the way, the growth of inter integrated circuits. Moore's law is primarily this range down here. Um, and here, of course, we're talking about huge, big, centralized computers. We think of mainframes that would be owned by major governments or major corporations. It was, at this point in time, banking was primarily, and this is, not done through centralized ledgers of any kind. It was no ledger. It was simply too expensive to keep track of transactions. If you have to manually enter every transaction, uh, if you then have to transmit them through telegraph lines where it could cost in today's dollars, 50, even $100 a word, think of an email where you spend $100 a word or $50 a word to send it, or a text message, um, this is prohibitively expensive. So we were dealing with a cash society and with a bare instrument society. Securities, for example, were, were gilded pieces of paper which were then stored and, and, and whoever hold the instrument owned that security or owned that funds. So this is kind of the history. And 1950 starts seeing the first credit cards come out. And then we start seeing the evolution of the centralized ledgers, starting primarily with the strength of the uh, mainframe computer in the 1970s and 1980s to today. Uh, credit cards, for example, was originally conceived in the 1950s, but really then it started to take up about the 1970s. Debit is more technology of the 1990s. So this is kind of important to sort of understand the history. What's significant is that between 1940 and 2000, which is this chart here, we see a fact of 10 to the 13 in the drop of price of computing. And, and it, we're going to stop here for a minute and ask this question. This is 10 to the 13. This is like 10 trillion. And by comparison, we need to ask the question, if we move from a, so a centralized ledger to a decentralized ledger, for example, Bitcoin or Monero, and let's say you have 100,000 nodes, what you actually are doing is you're making 100,000 copies of that information and then synchronizing them all. So you may impose a cost of 10 to the 5. Um, or maybe even 10 to the 6. But it's still, when you look at the history, it becomes extremely affordable. And the indication would be that in history of, of, um, of, of, human, of, of, of the world, um, the, we've, we've gone from bare instruments. There'll be a short period of time of centralized ledgers, and then we'll be actually moving to decentralized ledgers. So my next slide, I'm going to show a similar issue, uh, more recent, where we're talking about, again, the bandwidth. And this is bandwidth at high end in the United States, but it's a good indicator. Again, from 1983, we're talking about a log scale, to 2018, and we see about an increase in internet connectivity of 1.5 million times. 
uh, in, in the amount of bandwidth. Even more interestingly, in the last eight years alone, we see an increase in conductivity of approximately 26 times. And we don't think about this, suddenly we get an upgrade on our internet service. It is actually more pro pronounced if we look at developing countries where they may actually just jump two or three technologies when they put in fiber and they don't even bother with things such as copper. So what we're seeing is trends in technology um, that show this trend of the price dropping and what is very expensive in the past becomes incredibly affordable. So we come up with a couple of questions. Is it possible? Well, given time, yes, it is. If we only need a continuation of these trends even at a, at a slower rate, and then we, were, we would see decentralized ledgers essentially being competitive in the future with today's cost of a centralized ledger. So then Monero, or any kind of centralized ledger, decentralized ledger will be able to take in place. The cost differential is roughly about 20 to 30 years. So the cost of, say, today having a um, decentralized ledger could be comparable to the cost of a centralized ledger, say, a generation ago. That's a rough indication. There's a whole bunch of things in the pipeline. 3D ships. If you have NAND, if you have in your phones or in your tablets or on an SSD, those, those are 3D, sh 3D ships, the SSDs. Uh, that means that instead of laying one layer, you lay multiple layers on top of each other. Uh, carbon nanotubes has been considered as a potential uh, semiconductor. 5G, that's coming down the pipeline on the, uh, and we're talking about gigabit. Uh, lens. Even within copper, we're seeing um, DOSIS 3.x, which is going to be capable of gigabit over even existing cable networks. Fiber to the home. I know in, in both in, uh, in Vancouver, they're laying the fiber to the home right now. Uh, sure, initially they're going to say 150 um, megabits symmetrical, but that has capabilities in the gigabits. So we're looking at a growth in technology, and then we need to ask the question, so it is possible, let's see what we have learned from history. Well, first, I'm going to deal with a couple of cases, and the first case is very interesting, it's, it's, a, it's what we can learn from the credit card industry. Now, the credit card industry, we all love to criticize the banks, but sometimes we can learn from them, we can learn from their mistakes. In 1950, the Diners Club was introduced a 7% merchant fee. Now, why would you create and design a payment card with a 7% merchant fee? Well, because it costs a lot of money, the technology of the day, to keep track of the transactions. So you develop a business model around that. And the business model basically is you say, okay, you're, the, you're a merchant. We're going to provide this service, and we're going to incentivize the sale. We're going to make it attractive for a customer to come to your establishment, and sure, give us 7%, but we'll get you a sale. And that makes a lot of sense if the merchant has maybe a 50% margin on the product. It does not make sense for low margin merchants. But here's the interesting thing. Um, I'm a Canadian, I live in Canada, and I would have purchased gas with a Canadian credit card here in the United States. My cost would be roughly 7% today. Why? Because I would pay 3% of the gas station, every gas station basically charges a 3% surcharge for using a credit card, and then an additional 4% on the spread between the Canadian and U.S. dollars that is just charged by the, by the bank and the credit card companies. So my effective cost in 2018 is the same as it would have been the effective cost back for Diners Club in 1950. So the lesson here is really significant is the cost of technology can fall by, by a factor of 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, somewhere in that kind of range. But the business model that was developed in 1950, based on the technologies of the 1950s and the costs associated with those technologies, is still in use today and is starting to fail. Uh, another example, right in this, in this community, uh, you take a taxi for a short ride. So $3 surcharge for using a credit card. Well, that works at about 38%. Uh, if you have a seven or eight dollar taxi ride, maybe you, you spend a hundred dollars at three percent, but it's still quite high, and does not reflect in any way the cost of the technology. My second example is from the cryptocurrency, and we're talking about Bitcoin. Now, 
Bitcoin, um, initially, when it was released in 2009 and conceived in 2008, did not have a minimum one, a maximum one megabyte block size limit. This was added in 2010, approximately eight years ago. Shortly thereafter, there was a post on Bitcoin Talk with a proposal to actually get rid of this so we could scale like PayPal. That was the birth of the Bitcoin one megabyte block size debate eight years ago. The debate is still going on today, to this day. But in the meantime, technology is not lying still. The cost of transmitting those blocks over the internet and the speed is a factor of 26. Anybody who's familiar with the current Monero uh, block sizes, it's basically the difference between the current Monero block size and a typical um, Monero transaction, sorry, and a typical Bitcoin transaction. So uh, we're, not, we're talking about the existing product, not bulletproof. So the, this 26% decline in in the cost, it's not factored into the debate at all. We're still stuck in the, in the existing uh, business model, and we're going to basically say that we are going to keep debating this. Of course, the technology does not stand change. It, does, it doesn't wait. So what is really the solution? Well, the real issue in both of these cases is that the protocol, the business model, the social covenant does not support radical changes in technology. And, and this is the key element. The, in the case of the credit cards, they, the, the technology, the protocol was designed for the technology of the 1950s. It becomes totally irrelevant today, and they have having bigger and bigger problems. Litigation, uh, regulation in the European Union, and of course, these fees. In the case of Bitcoin, again, the protocol didn't support the, the scaling technology, and we're still stuck in the old protocol. The, the technology changes. So the question is, what is needed? And so we need to have a social covenant that actually can take advantage of future improvements in technology, even those future improvements in technology are as dramatic as the ones in the past. And at this point in time is when we take a look at Monero. So what makes Monero support the scaling? So what we have in Monero is the crypto node penalty function. Now, if we look at various incarnations of it, essentially what it says is you have a penalty. This is the block reward. So everything is proportional to the block reward. This would be the, the median transaction block size over the last 100 blocks or 300,000 bytes whichever is greater, and this is the proposed block size that you're going to mine. And essentially, you, put a, you impose a penalty on the miner that then has to be made up with by transaction fees. And this is basic definitions. The, the couple of key elements about this are interesting. The first thing is that the um, Transaction block size, if there's a maximum of two of twice, so you can only make it twice as big, and it's only applied when the proposed block size is greater than this effective median. So those are the key elements in it, in the penalty, the basics. Now, in order to really understand this better, I'm going to redefine the crypto uh, penalty, and I'm going to reintroduce this term called B, which is basically the percentage increase in the block size. So if you have a $300,000 block size and you have 30,000 uh, 300,000 uh, byte block size and you add 30,000 bytes, that's a 10% increase. Because in terms of this, we can then understand kind of how the whole system behaves. So basically, the penalty can then be reduced to the block reward times this percentage increase squared. This is the basic reduced crypto node penalty formula. There's a really interesting point about this. If B is less than zero, i.e. if you don't, there's no refund. Now, anyone care to guess why this is a burning of Monero? Any stabs at this? Why not refunding the penalty? 
Yes, that's true. But that, that actually does something else. It actually creates a burning of Monero. And the reason is because it delays the tail emission. So at any point in time in the future, there's going to be a smaller amount of Monero in the economy once the penalty is applied. And so that's just a, uh, a side note about that. Okay. So then we simply have the new reward. This is a very interesting. If you look at the rate of change of the penalty with how far the curve you are, I mean, how big of a scale you do, then you get this 2R base times B. So depending on the point of B, it's essentially linear. Uh, and that's what you would expect for a quadratic penalty. So now we ask the next question. What happens if we add a transaction T with the size of MT? So now we get, we're at a point in the penalty formula, and we're going to add an additional transaction. And this is the question the miner faces, because the miner has to decide, does this transaction generate the fee to justify its inclusion in the block? <coughs> so then you basically add the term. You take out the, the, uh, B, the B squared term, because it's the A16 penalty, and you're left with these two terms. Um, depending on the relative size of B and BT, BT being the, the additional uh, space of the transaction, you have two, two cases. If uh, B is much greater than BT, you can basically eliminate the B squared term. And then you get the, essentially the infinitesimal transaction model. Or in a case where B is significant, then, you, then it becomes dominant, and you get a case where, thank you, um, where we have a linear uh, penalty. We can then calculate the fee per byte in bytes. And again, our base is, is, is calculated by dividing by the um, effective median block size. Now, here's a key element. As that block size goes down, the price of a legitimate transaction in Monero falls in terms of Monero. Sorry, as it increases. So basically, if you go from, say, 300,000 bytes to 3 million bytes, your, your fee per byte has fallen by a factor of 10. At the same time, the spammer wanting to spam a certain percentage has to pay the same amount of money in terms of Monero. So that's a very interesting element. So the ham or the, or the legitimate transaction falls in price because the transaction size stays constant. So there's more transactions sharing the same amount of penalty. So this allows us to then define two types of transactions. So we define it a reference transaction. What a reference transaction is, is a typical Monero transaction that is applied at the penalty at the minimal uh, 300,000 um, byte penalty level. So what we're saying is we've got a 300,000 byte block, uh, block size. We're going to add a typical transaction. And from that, we can calculate what the fee has to be. And basically, that is the default fee per byte that you pay in Monero. Because the idea is we, we, we pay enough of a fee in that transaction so that transaction alone can support that scaling of itself. Otherwise, the miner wouldn't mine it and the block size wouldn't scale. That's how the default fee is set. And, and avoids this issue of it being stuck, like what can happen is nobody would create it and, and so you have a massive growth in the TX pool, but nobody's actually uh, using the, the uh, scaling because they're not paying enough of a fee. That's how the default fee in Monero is set. It is determined by the ratio of a typical transaction to the minimum effective block size, this minimum amount of 300,000 bytes. The low and the high fees are then a simple mul multiple of the normal fee. So that, that, that's where the penalty effectively determines the fee per byte and effectively determines the fee that you pay. At the other end, we have the, the opposite situation. In the opposite situation, what we have is we have a transaction of infinitesimal size where we're pushing the penalty to the maximum, so right at the maximum. In this case, basically, your fee per byte is twice the block reward divided by, again, the effective, uh, the, average, the median effective um, block size. And in this scenario, the miner would actually make four times the block reward in fees if someone were to push the penalty to the maximum. Now, in all this analysis, we're assuming a rational miner that mines to their best economic interest. 
and it therefore orders transactions in the block for their own perspective. So basically what the miner does is she would include in the block transactions the highest paying first until you get the lowest paying transaction that actually pays the penalty. So it's always the lowest paying transaction that pays the penalty. So this is kind of the, the, the basic dilemma of how fees are set. Okay, this is all great. But here's where it gets interesting. What happens if the base reward goes to zero? Any, anyone get a guess? What happens to the fees? The fees go to zero. So if there's no base reward, there are no fees. So it is impossible in this model to replace the base reward with a fee market. You can have a fee market, but a fee market for something entirely different. If your base reward is zero, you have no fees and you have an insecure coin. This is precisely a situation with crypto note reference, Bitcoin or Monero V. And Monero V is a classic example. You say, okay, we're going to stop the tail emission at some point in the future. Okay, how do, you, how do you actually incentivize the miners? You don't have any incentive. Because basically there's no penalty, so you just increase the, blo the block size at infinitum, and you get no money for fees. So, you, so the coin becomes insecure. Same thing with Bitcoin. Bitcoin right now is below Monero stale emission in fees. So this is really a problem. The question, co concept of a fee market that was proposed by Satoshi is in fact put into serious question in this case. I'm going to cover another example here, and this is the issue of orphan blocks and Peter Rison's uh, paper. This has been presented by some, in some circles as a replacement or a fee market. Yes, it's a fee market, but it's a fee market addressing the problem of orphan blocks created by pushing the technology too soon. It's a, it's a penalty, it's a fellowship present in Monero. And again, if you check, if everyone looks at reference, the result is proportional to the block reward. In the absence of the block reward, the reason penalty fails. It is a very valuable research, very important research, but it does not pr provide an answer to replacing the uh, block reward with fees. And this is actually a very sort of difficult question. One of the conclusions that one can make is that if you have another cryptocurrency and they impose a penalty in terms of the block reward that is weaker than that in Monero, then it's going to run in the same problem. So one can understand, for example, the position taken by Bitcoin Co. They said, well, we, have, we may have a problem here. We can't take the risk. We won't allow the block size to increase, effectively imposing an infinite penalty. And, and that's a reasonable course of action. It's better to have a small coin than an insecure coin. The other interesting thing is this issue is present in all major proof-of-work cryptocurrencies with very few exceptions. Uh, and the exceptions are Monero, Ion, Dogecoin, that I'm familiar with, that does have a permanent emission, it doesn't have an adaptive block size limit, and the really old but not well known Frycoin. Now, Frycoin does have a maximum number of coins, but what they've done is they've created demurrage. And basically, in that situation, the demurrage generates the block reward so the coin can stay secure. Yes, it's, it's worth about 300,000 in total market cap, sitting right at the bottom of uh, coin market cap, but it does address this question in a different way. So those are the exceptions. If it has, it's, uh, if it has a, yes, I think there are some that were uh, folk from Monero that keep the tail emission, so they will be fine. Yeah, so if they've got a tail emission, they, they, they would work. If, for example, they have demurrage, they would also, could, could also be made to work. But if you have a fixed amount of coins and you don't have demurrage, I have some real concerns. And that would be my, my answer to that, including some very high valuation cryptocurrencies. Okay, so the next question here, and this is another a bit of an aside, is Monero's, of course, planning to put bulletproofs in. Now, bulletproofs have a very interesting characteristic, and that is that it has a verification time that scales with the total number of outputs. And, and by outputs, I'm also including the uh, padded outputs that have to be put in. Um, 
And then the, the size of the bulletproof scales as the log to base two of the number of outputs. Well, it becomes fairly obvious that if you allow this thing to, if you allow very large bulletproofs with large numbers of outputs, then what happens is one has a potential attack vector, which was quite a bit of a concern. And so we have to deal with that attack vector. And how the solution to deal with it is to replace the block size and all those penalty calculations I showed before uh, with a block weight. And the block weight takes into account the verification time. And this is, was an idea that was actually initially proposed by Andy Toshi, um, and, and Smooth also discussed it. I kind of refined it, and we came up with the following. And basically what we do is you look at the bulletproof, and there is a, you, could, you take, if it's got one or two outputs, you leave it as is. And if you've got more than two outputs, you say, okay, if I had a bulletproof with two outputs, and then multiply that by the, the number of outputs, I get a size. I, I take the difference between that size and the size that you actually get, and I claw it back. And by clawing it back, I'm saying you're not really getting on it. I'm only going to give you about 20%. So this creates this term, which is linear in K. I can show you, which is BP base times, times K down here. And that effectively deals with this attack vector. The other element of it, of course, is that the maximum number of outputs in a bulletproof is limited to 16, so you can really prevent any kind of attack from this angle. Um, so this is kind of a tweak, but it kind of shows the kind of things that it is. I mean, the purpose of fees in a cryptocurrency is to deter spam attacks. This is why Satoshi put the one megabyte limit in Bitcoin in the first place. And in this case, again, we have to be careful. If we're going to change the um, privacy uh, ring confidential transaction uh, technique, we are faced with having to tweak the whole weight system to give us a weight that actually takes into account the verification cost. So in future, we will hear about block weights rather than block size. That really only makes a difference if you have more than two outputs in a transaction. But that's the reason why. We will see that. Okay, I'm going to now briefly talk about something else. And this is called the equation of exchange in economics. Now, the equation of exchange in economics is actually a sort of a tautology. And basically what you have is you have the money supply, which in a cryptocurrency is actually set by protocol. V is the velocity. Now, people are familiar with the velocity of money is. It essentially is how, many, how fast the same piece of money circulates. So you, you get, say, uh, in the US dollar example, you receive, say, a salary, and then, say, 90% is spent within the 90-day uh, period. That, then how long before that same dollar comes back to you? That is actually the velocity of money. P is the actual price of goods and services in, st in terms of the currency. And that is, can be thought of as if P is high, that means we have a lot of inflation. P is low, we have deflation. In this model here, Q has been shown in a simplified manner. And, and by that I mean that typically, in an economy, you have a very large distribution of goods and services. So if we have, for example, cups of coffee and million dollar watches in the same distribution, you're gonna have different queues. And so you look at the total distribution of the goods and services. So here's the really interesting question that comes in. The first interesting point that comes out of this is in a proof of work cryptocurrency, if we assume the economy doesn't change, 
we have the same types of goods and services, but we simply make it bigger, then Q is actually proportional to the block weight of site. So this is basically saying, it has some real implications in the case of Monero, that if we double the transactional activity, we have to double effectively the price of the currency. Because M doesn't change, it's set by protocol. V hasn't changed because you haven't changed the nature of the economy. You just make the economy larger. And in fact, this is actually, from a theoretical point of view, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a speculator or an investor, you ask the question, okay, I want to buy this because I expect this fi uh, future increase in, in, um, in Q in the future, and therefore uh, a decrease in P. The other implication is if we come back to the um, actual how fees are calculated, well, notice that fees are now calculated we're dividing by the block size. Well, that has a real implication because now what happens is if the economy doesn't change, fees actually should remain constant once we hit tail emission in terms of actual purchasing power. Because if you double the size of the economy, thereby doubling the price, the fees in terms of Monero fall by half. So you have, we have a very elegant <coughs> excuse me, solution where the fees in Monero will stay constant in real terms. Now, there's a lot of KBS with this. The first KBS, of course, is, and this has, has recently happened in Bitcoin, is what happens if you change the velocity. So, for example, you, you decide we're no longer a transactional currency, we're not going to become a store of wealth, and people are not going to move these things around, and therefore the velocity goes um, drastically <coughs> down, that causes speed to go down, that's one possibility. The other possibility is you change the nature of the goods and services. So, for example, instead of buying cups of coffee, we buy million-dollar watches. Well, then in that example, then, of course, you get uh, a similar situation. But it is an indicator that Monero really is very much in, in harmony with basic laws of economics and how the fees are set. Because essentially we're saying in Monero we have... A, a block size economy set, uh, and a set fee that basically can be it's, it's a set it and forget it approach. So if, in the sense of how our fees work, and it is in very much in harmony as the, uh, with the, um, what's called the, the equation of exchange in economics. Okay. Now, <coughs> most people are familiar with Monero as a fungibility, privacy, and anonymity coin. And I have spent virtually no time on this subject. Um, I, I guess one of the, the messages is that there's a lot more to Monero than fungibility, privacy, and anonymity. In fact, Monero has the most successful support at the social covenant level for scaling of any major cryptocurrency. And I do not say that lightly. Largely, this is due to the combination of the adaptive block size limit the crypto policy with the minimum tail emission, which gives you the security. And the minimum tail emission is absolutely critical to maintain proof of work security. <coughs> of course, the chains, uh, in this case, in Monero are fundamentally different from other uh, proof of work cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin. Well, again, what happens in Bitcoin <coughs> is that people compete against each other for fees in, in a fixed block size. And no matter what the fees go up, you can't increase the, 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 the have to compete with each other. What happens in Monero is you're actually competing against the penalty. So we're pushing against this penalty, which is actually what you're, you're competing against. The next question, and I really, I know this is a difficult question for a lot of people, especially if you're holding a lot of currencies that have this issue. They're really fundamental unresolved questions with respect to the viability fee market as a means of replacing fees. And if there's a message, I think some quite real hard questions need to be asked about this. It's a phrase in the original Bitcoin uh, white paper. Um, unlike the rest of the work which 
literally is a work of genius. This phrase is provided with no justification whatsoever. Um, and nobody afterwards has tried to provide any kind of justification. There is, however, a significant amount of literature already and questions being asked about its viability, even in the presence of a flex fixed box size. So that is a question that, in my opinion, needs to be really looked at much more seriously. Um, unfortunately, virtually every other major proof of work cryptocurrency has copied Bitcoin in this sense. And I'm talking about Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, uh, things such as uh, Ccash. They've all done the same thing. And Dash, in fact, in that case, you have to support not just the miners, but also the masternodes and the community, uh, and the community development. So none of this is a question. It's putting Monero, quite aside from privacy, fungibility, and, and anonymity, head and shoulder over most of the competition. It is not a well-known aspect of Monero. It is one that I hold very dear to my own heart because that's what I work on. But it's, it enables the kind of ideals that have been discussed here. Like, we want to help people in the developing world. We want to send money to poor countries in small amounts because that currency is plunging in value. This is the example, I think, of Venezuela that I heard. Well, you know, the thing is crashing so fast that you want to send, like, really small amounts so, so the thing actually, um, you can't hold the money in that currency. So these kind of things. So this type of social impact on a cryptocurrency can only really happen if you have scalability. The next question, what about second tier solutions? Lightning network, great technology. But that lightning network technology depends on being able to scale the underlying chain. You have to close the channels. And if the underlying chain cannot support closing the channels, you cannot have an effective lightning network. In fact, my understanding is already work has been done by Globally to actually put this kind of technology on the Monero blockchain. Well, what work? Um, so that's a real risk of a Lightning Network. So again, there are real questions there, because if you can't close the channels, what do you do? Uh, if you read the Lightning Network paper, they're talking about 166 megabyte blocks in Bitcoin, by the way, as a minimum. So it illustrates the problem. This is great technology. It doesn't solve the problem. Just as the example of, of Reason's work. Great work, excellent uh, paper, but it does not address the issue of this um, creating this fee market. Uh, it's a tough thing to say. Um, I personally do not hold any Bitcoin. That's, I will say that publicly. Um, and one of the main reasons is because of this. But uh, I should just mention this. There needs to be a conversation on this subject, um, given the amount of money involved at this point in time. I will now thank you, and if there's any questions. But I mean, okay. Basically, what I mentioned about offering race, and this is basically the work of Peter Rison's papers. So I was, I recommend you read that because that's why the analysis was done. But essentially, it is this: if you increase the offering rate. The miner will now see a lower reward because they've got to mine all these blocks that are going away. So effectively, in order to increase the block size or the block weight, the miner has to charge more money to compensate for the loss of the offering rates. That is essentially the argument in um, Peter Reason's paper. Basically, it's an exponential function, um, so it's a fairly stiff penalty. But again, proportional to the block reward that actually kicks in. So it would basically be a check and balance against, against a currency like Monero, for example, getting ahead of the technological or the technology. So it puts a barrier in that. It's a natural barrier. It's very hard for a blockchain to actually measure um, this type of problem. And that's one of the few ways it can. like going from, say, two minutes to, say, four minutes. There's been some discussion of that. Um, that uh, I mean, at one point, it was one minute, which is too low. The, yeah, it's way too low. And in fact, probably the most extreme example that I'm familiar with is Ethereum, and they're about 15 seconds. Well, the problem with that is that you're, you're basically hitting um, the speed of light. 
Um, it's not as much a scalability issue as a latency issue. Latency doesn't change. So if we are sending a telegraph signal in 1850 across the Atlantic, you have basically the same latency on that signal. The switching is really much slower, but than you have today. Not the latency, the bandwidth. Okay, the big difference. If you increase demand on bandwidth, then that is essentially the issue of orphan blocks. Um, do you improve that by increasing the, 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 the time? I, it's possible. I mean, it's, it's an interesting discussion. Uh, but I think the Damian issue there is latency as opposed to bandwidth. In, in that particular, because it's a very serious problem if you start going below a minute. Any further questions? You talked about um, how the meter is in favor, there were unresolved questions about the viability of the free market, but um, can, you, can you be a little more specific about why you're skeptical rather than just saying that there are questions? Well, uh, I, mean, I mean, it comes back to the fundamental question of how fees are calculated in Monero. If you, if you go back to, um, if you look at the fee formula, the, f the total fees per block are proportional to the block reward. So the question then becomes as this, do you, do you have two choices? You either create a really stiff penalty, which is what Bitcoin has done. That may work. Um, but what happens in that point, uh, the, the, the chain can't scale. So you basically have limited the growth of the blockchain, period, or growth of the economy. No matter what happens to bandwidth, to CPU power, to any of this other stuff, you can have another 10 to the 13 drop in these costs. You still have the same problem. Well, it is being misrepresented because he has, yes, I, I, with respect, I mean, Peter Rissen's paper has been presented as a fee market. That's how it's presented. But w the conclusions are not a fee market to replace the Satoshi model. It is a fee market to address open blocks in the presence of a block reward. That is the conclusion that it does. So yes, it's a fee market, but it deals with something else. So Peter Rosen's paper does not solve the Satoshi model at all. It is just as present in Monero as it is in, in, in Bitcoin, or Bitcoin Cash, or Dash, or, or Litecoin. That doesn't change. It solves a very important problem and addresses it, but not the one that we're trying to solve. But yeah, I mean, it comes down to the fees going to zero because there's no competition. And people might say, well, what about if I create a protocol of minimum fees? Well, th that's going to be out, out of band uh, payments, and so that will basically cause it to collapse anyway. Any further questions? Yes. For, yes, absolutely. Because basically what happens if you're a miner, you're putting all this energy into, 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 into mining off on blocks. So you're not getting the reward from those blocks. But, it, but there's still a cost to mine the, fail, the failed off on rock. And that's the cost that the miner has to seek compensation for. And, and, and presumably in terms of fees. Question? Sorry? Okay, that's a latency issue. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an example of a strong latency issue. It's not a bandwidth issue. It is a latency issue. Because essentially what you have, and it's no different in many respects, only bigger, than me mining a block in Prince George, British Columbia, that was my, uh, on top of, say, a mine that, uh, uh, that Ricardo made in, in, uh, in the Western Cape of South Africa. If you increase your latency, then, we, then obviously either you really increase the block type, which is, or you're going to have to split the, the chain because of the time it takes light to get from Earth to Mars and back. That's a speed of light problem. And that's fundamentally a latency problem. And again, I would argue in that scenario that bandwidth can be increased, but not latency.
unless someone finds a way around um, special and general relativity. Sorry. Any, any further questions? Um, interestingly, a combination of say yes or no. <laughs> Sorry, by me. Okay, so if we actually, what happened with Monero is there was secret ASICs. There was a fork, which basically obsoleted the ASICs. And it was done by tweaking the uh, proof of work enough so the ASIC couldn't actually efficiently uh, mine it. That led to the creation of a coin called XMO XMC, which has gone nowhere, but it, a lot of money has been thrown at it. Um, I would say this, there's a limited ASIC resistance in the combination of the, the response from the community. This, the, the fork received a very high degree of support combined with development work in progress, and a perfect example is what Howard is, uh, was talking about, combined with the basic principle that the threat is more effective than its execution. If you're gonna try and pull that off and you wonder, well, this community is just gonna focus and leave us high and dry, that's a deterrent effect. So there's a whole bunch of factors uh, that create a degree of ASIC resistance in Monero, over, but strictly speaking, I mean, it's been demonstrated that at this point in time, if you don't dynamically change it or change the proof of work to address it, there isn't that strong an asset resistance. It's more the behavior of the community, the response of the community, and the threat of being left high and dry and these tweaks. So that's why the ASIC resistance in Monero is coming from right now. Uh, you go first. Sure, absolutely. I mean, but, but is, will it matter is the question that I ask. I mean, does it really matter today when you send an email that you might just decide to put that information into a Word document or, or an open office document and, and attach that multiplying the size of the email? It's not because the cost is in there. And I suspect that in the future, that's what's going to happen. The difference in cost is not going to be significant. If you're paying $100 a Word to send an email, you're going to change your pros. And in fact, if one goes online, there's such a thing called a telegram style. People wrote prose in such a way as to minimize these costs. People don't do that anymore. So I would argue that yes, there, there, there could be a disadvantage, but in the case of pretty well every coin, the only coin that could potentially compete with Monero at this point would be Dogecoin, because Bitcoin doesn't allow this, uh, the thing to scale anyway. So we, we already had, and, and the same is true all the major ones. And Dogecoin has not impl uh, implemented a, uh, an adaptive block size limit. Could you create a Monero clone without privacy and make the transactions uh, a fifth of the size? Yeah. Is it going to be a huge competition? I'm not so sure. Mm hmm Well, in short to medium term, what's going to happen is that we're going to have uh, bulletproofs come in. That's going to drop the price in the very short term by a factor of five. Then on top of that, you have the fact that the transactions are smaller. So in the very short term, you actually see a drop in fees by a factor of 25. Um, so that's the answer of the short to medium term. I'm, I'm more of a long term kind of person, so I tend to focus. I, I be, really believe you take care of the long term, the short medium term will take care of itself. You pay your patiently waiting. Um, personally, I have a lot of concerns with proof of stake. And the reason I do is because even without looking at things like the not a stake problem and all the sort of traditional things, there's a very basic attack on proof of stake. And what that is, is you borrow the thing. Proof of stake is based on the concept 
that the owner of, of the coin is also the beneficial owner of the coin. Well, that's not the case. The minute that you have a third party that is holding the coins in trust for somebody else and maybe spend some of them, and we've had great examples in Mongox, even early in Bitcoin with uh, pirated 40. Look them up in... Uh, well, what happens in these situations is the person who actually controls the coin, therefore controls the stake, may have an interest in crashing the coin rather than supporting it because they're not the beneficial owner. They're essentially a creditor where they own that currency. So I, I really have a real concern. Objectively, and I think there's lessons from fiat in this, a lot of the problems that were caused in the uh, 2008 crash were driven by the fact that you have people lending money that wasn't their own. They were setting the, the lender and the borrower up to fail. And then they walk away with some fee. It's the same problem. So fundamentally, I really don't believe that proof of, take, uh, proof of stake actually is sound. Without even getting into the technical details. So that'll be my sort of feeling on that. I, I, I don't see it. Yes. Mm -hmm. We've also seen in Bitcoin how uh, a great deal of share value is how young and new people are used to capture. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so, can you just talk to how we might learn from what happened in Bitcoin and the other encounters with a similar problem in Monero? How it might be dealt with as opposed to just uh, only one in a quarter? Okay. My argument is that the fundamental problem with the social covenant in Bitcoin is that it's simply is fundament, it's a fundamental flaw in the scaling algorithm. So you have a flaw in a critical element of Bitcoin that leads to the conflict the and then leads to the breakdown that, that you're mentioning, and it's very real. Um, the, the, the key, the biggest strength that Monero has is that we have a social covenant that can support long-term technological change. Yes, you have the social issues, but if you don't have a fundamental flaw to deal with, which I believe is the case in Bitcoin, then I don't think the comparison is, is, is really that apt because basically the reason Bitcoin is, is having this breakdown is because you have two very legitimate points of view. One of them says, it's a security issue. We cannot increase the block size. The other one says, what about the businesses? What about the second layer tiers? I mean, you have a company like Globally. They're, they're in, in Monero, they're going to build a structure on top of Monero. Well, you try to do that in Bitcoin. So you have a group of two legitimate points of view. And in that situation, it's very easy to trash the other side than to come with a constructive uh, argument because you simply prove the other side is wrong. And that's, that's essentially the stage for the conflict. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Do you think if you get the science, you know, in Monero Cone is right? Pardon me? If you get the science right, in Monero Cone, like the Cone Power will get the numbers, then there won't be any breakdown. You, you definitely mitigate the breakdown risk. Absolutely. Are there any more questions? Before we. Are there any more questions or comments? Yeah. Any more questions or comments? I just I wanted to comment just on this kind of like this example of Bitcoin. Just something that comes to mind when I uh, do the Lightning Network work, we have the Aerobic channel, and that's still a major chain of transactions. So if you think Bitcoin can be referred to the future and everybody will understand it because it's usable, you need to be able to enroll Absolutely excellent comment. That's all I can say. I mean, it's essentially the 166 megabyte block to support it. So it's the same issue. Yeah, absolutely.
One more question. Well, in the United States, that question was resolved actually to a large degree by a ruling from FinCEN in 2013. And it identified what is called a decentralized and centralized uh, cryptocurrency. Interestingly enough, Monero is one of the lowest risk ones because we don't have a pre-mine, we don't have an ICO, we don't have a post-mine, we don't have a funders reward, all of which sets up the stage. In this country, I, I think we're, uh, we're in very strong grounds. There's some, some concerns of moves in the, in the European Union. I think uh, primarily they, they're too fixated on blockchain analytics. So that could be a, a, a concern in that respect. So that's kind of my, my sort of feeling on that one. Um, I think the United States is probably going to be one of the safest places for, for, for cryptocurrency. Um, how are we doing for time? One minute. Well, I would argue that uh, in, in this particular example, I would actually argue that the United States is going to be a bastion on the war on cash, in supporting cash. And all you have to do is take a taxi ride in the city. And ask the question, how many people are going to pay $3 on, on, an, on an $8 taxi ride? Because basically, that is a fundamental battle in the war on cash. Anyway, I think we're running out of time, so I will thank you.